can see people are slowly joining our meeting. I see some familiar faces. So I see some familiar uh, names. Very nice. Very nice to see everyone. We will start in a few minutes. Uh, it's also the first time for me I'm hosting uh, a webinar. So we really hope that uh, the technology will be on our side. And uh, so this is uh, uh, also a very exciting for me. So I, I don't know like what you've seen in the beginning. I was trying to share the slide uh, with, the, with our guest speaker today, but let's see. Yeah, well, but I think we can we can slowly start. So we it's uh, it's our hour. We start uh, today at uh, four um, at four o'clock, and so uh, this is uh, uh, also a first uh, webinar uh, that is going to uh, we will have like a couple of, of those coming up uh, in uh, in uh, uh, in the future. And so today uh, we are. Um, uh, uh, also, it's, I think it's very topical, uh, the, uh, the, the talk uh, that is, uh, Anna is going to give us uh, today. And uh, it, it, I'm very excited because it's, uh, I think it's, it's going to be very interesting. So I will uh, ask uh, you for, uh, for, to mute your uh, microphones once you're joining the meeting. Uh, we will record uh, everything. So also the meeting is uh, uh, going to be available afterwards. And we will open up uh, also for questions uh, at the end of the talk. And uh, also, but feel free to uh, uh, also write some of your questions uh, on the chat. And uh, I hope also, uh, I uh, I hope my um, one of my uh, colleagues will join me to help me a little bit to uh, to screen for the questions so that we have we have them uh, also voiced up at the end of the meeting. And so this is uh, a collaboration between our time perspective network and so which are spread out around the world and different people studying different aspects of time. And uh, also uh, with the help of uh, DIS, who is providing us this opportunity of using the Zoom uh, during this also uh, interesting times for us. And so this is an open talk, both for the uh, uh, participants of my class at uh, Psychology of Time, and it's also open for everybody who is interested uh, to hear it uh, uh, today. And so uh, we, uh, I'm very much excited to hear my colleague, uh, Anna Yusupova, uh, so with whom we studied together in Moscow State University. And so currently Anna is uh, working in a very interesting field. So she's working with the uh, astronauts. And uh, so I think this uh, experiences of uh, uh, subjective time in uh, this type of oscillation is going to maybe give us some uh, also insights uh, in, in our current uh, conditions that we are finding uh, ourselves in. And so Anna, uh, she is the lead uh, scientific researcher and she works at the laboratory of cognitive and social psychology in the institute for biomedical problems in moscow uh, in russia and i think uh, from here i will just give the floor uh, to anna and uh, i will be present nearby <laughs> thank you well th hi everybody i'm very glad to see you here and um, it's really a very well a uh, spe special time that we're living in now and experiencing all the same problems everywhere uh, in well in most of the countries so uh, i think that the experience that um, i cosmonauts and astronauts have may really help us to um, live a good life in the current con conditions that we're all in and uh, it's been about 20 years. I started in September 2000, but I'm um, uh, in research for, well, with astronauts, cosmonauts, and uh, different uh, ICE, so-called um, isolated and confined environments. And um, time uh, is a subject that we are not accessing directly in our experiments, but it comes out very um, well in a, on a regular basis, exactly because in um, uh, in um, isolated environments, uh, the sensation and perception of time is very uh, special, 
And so I now today I will share with you uh, the insights uh, that uh, we have from isolated environments. Uh, also the um, research that exists for the moment. And I think that this will be not, well, this will be of course an academic talk, but regarding our situation, I think that you will, you will find it, you may find it useful for your everyday life. So I think I may, sh I may switch to uh, my PPT file. I'll try to do this. Um, yeah. Well, I think you see my, my presentation, don't you? Yeah. Okay. So, um, um, well, what will you learn today? First of all, what are the extreme and confined environments? Because there are several uh, of them. Uh, why type time perception is different in these environments? And what are the positive and negative effects of different time perception on life of isolated subjects? Uh, this is all, of course, based on research and a lot of evidence that we gathered during the 20 years of work. Uh, so, well, um, there are many types of isolated environments, even for, for example, hermits who choose to be, um, to live alone. They are also isolated subjects, self-isolated, isolated subjects. But, um, even for example, uh, you know, isolation in, in fact is, um, regarded very negatively in a common way because, uh, our practice of our state is normally to isolate subjects when they are doing something wrong, for example. So, for example, the jail also is a isolation from society. So basically we all live in, um, we all grow up with the sensation that isolation is something that's bad. So for example, when you're a kid, your mother tells you that if you will not finish your homework or if you, you're, I don't know, you're, um, I know the, you will do something wrong. You will, you will do your homework not correctly. You will not be allowed to go out and play. So this is a, you know, this negative uh, image of isolation that we get um, step by step. But in fact, there are many situations when isolation is um, a very positive thing. And uh, so this is what I'm, I'm studying. First of all, the space flight. Uh, as you can, as you may imagine, but this type of isolation is something that really people really dream of, so it's not that bad. And also there are polar winterings. This is also a professional situation that many, well, not very, not many people want to go to, but there are people who return to polar winterings um, regularly. For example, I worked with uh, French polar winters and found out that uh, from the whole expedition that I was, I don't know, about 60 uh, people, something like that, about two thirds of them were returning winter. So finally, it's not that bad as well. And so um, I will give you as much information as I can on these three, um, three main situations. So um, first of all, space flight. Okay. Um, the second, I'll, I'll try to uh, show you the video here. Well, about about space flights. Um, how do I work with space flights? First of all, I can access psychological features of space flights through my experiment. I have uh, an experiment that a method that I brought to uh, the ISS named Content. Uh, and it's a part of a Russian scientific program, long-term program. So the content analysis method that I'm working uh, on for years is um, about is about creating a list of uh, meaningful categories um, that uh, I'm looking, I'm searching for in talks of uh, cosmonauts with mission control. So there are mm, different type of talks, and I'm working with the talk that I go that goes through open channels. So I'm not analyzing anything, any talks with their physicians, their private talks with families, etc. So I'm working only with open channels. So um, the time category is one of the categories that I'm monitoring constantly, uh, starting from 2015. So I can give some details on that. 
Also from on the other side, I'm making interviews with uh, all the cosmonauts before they go to ISS and after they return. So these are interviews that, well, um, I'm talking on expectations uh, before they leave. And I'm talking with them on the with the reality and how did they find how did they find the reality of uh, flight after they return and the issue of time uh, comes out very um, well I think in every interview um, from the third, uh, well from the third side together with Canadian Space Agency we've made a huge project interviewing. Uh, reti- well, cosmonauts that are already veterans, astronauts and cosmonauts that are um, that have already finished their career. It was about um, well, 21 interviews, semi-structured, um, from one and a half to four hours each. And the um, question about the importance of time factor, uh, same came out very frequently in these interviews. So, well, basically, t- um, time perception in space flight is not observed well enough, in my opinion. I think that is due to two main facts. First of all, um, the psychophysiological mechanism of perception of time uh, is not quite clear. Um, And this is quite challenging to try, well, when you try to make objective measurements of something that um, you don't really know how it works. And uh, um, so you have to, uh, try to find uh, ways to make objective measures of just objective reality, finally. And um, so uh, there are several hypotheses about um, the psychophysiological basis of time perception. Well, as far as I know, for example, Fyechin, a uh, very well-known Russian physiologist um, working in late uh, 19th century, he referred to muscle sensation as drivers for time perception. So he believes that the act of walking creates uh, elements for measuring length and small sections of time. And uh, the basic unit then of this periodic, this basic u- unit of the periodic movement uh, that, are, well, that occurs when you're walking uh, is a spatial measure and the measure of time at the same, at the same place and time. And so, there is a simultaneous association with this um, two sensations. But if, uh, if uh, this is the mechanism, uh, then normally astronauts shouldn't have any sensation of time at all, but they still do have the sensation. So it works differently. Uh, about 10 years ago, the popular opinion on that was that, um, well, up to what I know, um, is that uh, there is a neurobiological connection of perception of time, space, location of objects and events, uh, all provided by hippocampal formation. But um, now there are some results showing that representations of time and space um, may use the same cortical network, presumably located in the right parietal cortex. Unfortunately, we don't have any clearer vision. And uh, well, if you have, um, uh, if you know something, if you have insights about uh, any new experiments that uh, clarify psychophysiological mechanism of time perception, I would be very interested to hear that. But the second uh, reason for insufficient number of data on time perception in space is the fact that um, the standard time on orbit is only six months, and um, even even if it's long. Um, we already noticed that um, the evidence time perception disturbances during spaceflight start to show up later. And we also see it when we compare um, it with long-term isolation experiments. While we do not have enough experimental data on um, spaceflight, we can still make use of anecdotal reports from interviews. And uh, time and space um, may be um, um, a second. I'm sorry, just a second. So time and space may be an interesting um, from two points of view. Uh, subjective perception, but also the precision of its perception for certain behavioral acts that we need uh, in space to operate correctly. And uh, looking for answers 
um, for the second question, we can observe experience from uh, and data from jet pilots, parachute jumping, and some evidence from other jobs uh, that require precise direction. So about the examples from other jobs. Um, this is a, a well, I think rather interesting uh, a story that in 1795, uh, yes, Neville Mescal, the director of Greenwich Observatory, dismissed an astronomer named Kimbrick because uh, he would record the meridian passage of stars with a time lag of half a second. Mescal detected uh, the Kimbrick's uh, fault by um, uh, comparing his, da the, his data with his own and of course, he was sure that his data is absolutely correct. And um, but 30 years after, um, a German astronomer named Friedrich Bessel established that all observers, masculine included, determined the meridian passage of stars inaccurately, and that it was found that for each astronomer, um, each astronomer had his own, his own average time lag, period of latency. Uh, that was individual, in fact. And so this time lag has ever been, uh, since, ever since been taken into account as a uh, specific coefficient in, um, astronomical in astronomical calculation. It's called uh, personal equation. And uh, so the time that is required for a simple motor response um, was, was first measured by Helmholtz in 1850, and it was found that the difference it differs a lot from person to person, ranging from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 seconds. But as soon as the uh, experiment gets slightly more complicated, for example, when a button has to be pressed to choose the correct color, uh, then the motor response is delayed up to 0 0.5 seconds and more. And the delay in the uh, psychophysiological uh, response uh, became uh, evident um, in uh, flying jet aircraft. Just a second, I will try to show you the, the jet aircraft video. So for jet aircraft, the thing is that um, um, they have to react really quickly to what's happening um, to what's happening during um, during the flight. And however, they, when they approach the speed of um, sound, they um, have a blind area of about uh, 100 meters that uh, they do not see at all. And um, this means that what they see as something that's really, really near, they have already passed it. And so that means that um, uh, if there are two jet, air, uh, two jet aircraft um, that are approaching one another, uh, they have a blind area, blind distance for about two, 200 meters or less. And if you compare this with um, uh, space flight, uh, you should understand that this one and a half to two seconds that they appear to have as a blind area in terms of time. This is the time where, um, well, for example, ISS, International Space Station, covers about 16 kilometers. So you may think that at first, at first glance, uh, at such a sea, astronauts are not able to uh, react at all to many events in space. So this is why the um, aircraft, uh, spacecraft system should combine automated reactions uh, of mechanisms and decision making of a human astronaut. So this is this is the the point that we also should also uh, always consider when uh, making ergonomical decisions, taking ergonomical decisions um, for spacecraft. So the parachute jump also provide interesting evidence about perception of time. Um, when we are comparing two situations, in fact, uh, when uh, we see uh, the parachute jumps that the subject makes, well, for example, his first or second time, and when he's already experienced. So these are the, the 
in these two case, cases, the time perception is really different. So um, I'll give you just a little quote of the of the guy called Yuri Gagarin. This is the first. This was his first name in space, and he was describing his very first parachute jump. He said, I pushed off from the roof surface of the plane exactly as thought and rushed down as if into an abyss. I pulled the ring, but the parachute does not open. I want to shout, but I can't. The air cloaks my breath. So the, the, my hand here automatically reached for the reserve parachute ring. But where is it? I can find it. Uh, and suddenly, I feel a strong push backwards and silence. I sway gently in the sky under the white dome of the main parachute. Uh, it opened up in time, of course, and it was much too early for me to think about the spare one. Unquote. So time perception um, changes significantly under stress, as you can see in parachute jump. So the time flow is going faster than expected. To create this feeling of uh, emergency and need to op oops, sorry, I need to operate. Um, this first jumping evidence shows us a very general effect of um, time perception because uh, these parachute jumpers, as soon as they have, uh, they make their 20 to 25 jumps, they start to get reproaches from their commanders because they tend to open their parachutes later than they should, just because they want to have more fun on free fall. And so in this case, after a certain experience, they needed more time to get the feeling of, of emergency. So the time flow became some kind of slower. So it, it shows us uh, the, the well, time perception relies a lot on uh, emotions. Uh, if you are doing your jump, the first time you have um, much more uh, emotions and feelings of stress than uh, when you're doing your 25th or 30th uh, jump. What do you have in space flight? Um, well, all studies have shown, including our Russian Canadian project as well, that um, space flight is perceived uh, by astronauts and cosmonauts as the main peak, uh, you know, the, the most significant. Um, career and life event. And um, it creates the desire of most uh, astronauts, uh, cosmonauts, to live this period with maximum efficiency uh, and benefit, to do as much as possible. And against this background, every second, every minute, every hour in space is filled with a very special meaning. Uh, it leads some, some kind of a spiritual uplift, emotional uplift very high motivation. And so um, they are extremely motivated to complete their flight mission and to do everything as they should. Um, but um, mm, so the astronaut's perception of time and flight is uh, very intense. It makes the phenomena that I'm going to talk about uh, clearer. Uh, first of all, um, anecdotal reports by astronauts and cosmonauts suggest a very um, strange time perception phenomenon named time compression syndrome. In this phenomenon, time is compressed relative to the perception gained on Earth. So um, uh, cosmonauts are doing their simulations, they are training, etc., on Earth, and they know, um, for example, that they are doing this procedure uh, well in this amount of time. But as soon as they get uh, to the International Space Station, they have a sensation that every operation lasts a lot, a lot longer. And they perceive it as something uh, very stretched uh, in time. They have, uh, they have much more attention to each small operation that I, they are doing during this whole unit, operational unit. Um, and um, what uh, this is a very common thing, and uh, there is a uh, uh, question of perception, the way they perceive it. This is subjective, well, moment, but there is also an uh, objective data 
that show that um, there is some kind of um, um, uh, how would I say uh, the chrono deficiency planning. In fact, it is a um, phenomenon that's common for all the cosmonauts and astronauts in flight. The ground services on Earth are making uh, the scheduling uh, for astronauts um, based on what they know uh, about the time that each operation should take. And uh, they um, have this vision, have this, well, they have uh, the time for each operation written uh, according to the, mm, well, the, the experience that they saw on Earth. That, for example, the cosmonaut, I don't know, Mr. Smith, he's doing this operation, for example, in five minutes, he's, he's done. So they are preparing the individual schedules according to this information that they um, gather very well with lots of attention on Earth. But as soon as the same Mr. Smith uh, gets to the orbit, everybody finds out that uh, the schedule is not working at all because he needs much more time for each operation. So, and this is the, you know, the chrono deficiency planning is that, um, this is exactly that, that, uh, you need to assign more time for each operation, uh, in space. Why doesn't have, does it happen? Well, normally, um, the main hypothesis is that there is a, um, phenomenon of fluid shift, so-called fluid shift. What is that? Um, on Earth, we are all, we live all, everybody, under conditions of 1G. So um, our system, blood system, uh, uh, is, um, well, is trained that the, when, for example, the, the blood from the head goes down by itself, but for example, in the legs, you have to really work to, to push the blood uh, upward in order for it to reach the heart, because the heart is here. And uh, the whole body system, in fact, works on that. We do not feel it because this is our normal life condition. But as soon as the, as the body gets into space, uh, it doesn't work like that. And so, for example, there is a, um, uh, I, I like this, uh, American, um, uh, American Austrians uh, have called this the chicken legs phenomenon. So, uh, as your legs, uh, normally your blood system and all the fluids, uh, are taking up, up, um, from your legs to, to the upper part of the body, uh, uh, when you go down, you have chicken legs. Really, your head, your legs are very thin. If they, you have really lots of problems with muscles. And for example, if you, if you ever meet an astronaut or cosmonaut before he's going into space and then you see him on TV, he's really strange on TV, you know, on TV because his face is, you know, strangely deformed as if he is, he, he had a really drunk, drunken a lot yesterday. Yeah. Because he's all, he, he has too much liquid in, in his head. Exactly, because his head in normal conditions is not working on putting the, the fluid downward because it all, all flows by itself. So this is the problem of fluid shift. It is uh, one of the main problems of um, physicians uh, who work with, uh, with space flight. But so the main hypothesis about this, the fact that all the astro astronauts and cosmonauts require more time for each operation, especially in the beginning of flight, is that this disbalance of fluid in the body disturbs the normal functional of the brain. They can really, they, they are okay in their, in their heads. I mean, they are talking properly, etc. But uh, apparently, the uh, fluid shifts and the, the changes in fluid shifts in the period of adaptation to spaceflight 
has a, a really important effect on um, on um, um, speed of reaction and on type perception as well. So about um, about research, um, there are not many really well done researches on time perception in space flight. Um, and uh, there is a very nice research, this is really a very classical one. Uh, I think they made it in the beginning of 90s. Um, uh, it was made by US Air Force, specialists Albury and Reperger. Reperger. Uh, they studied the time period estimation. So the Air Force study um, reported mission performance effects during the critical re-entry period. What does it mean? So after the astronauts have adapted to the zero G environment, during the, you know, this short shuttle mission, they normally, they, they did the whole experiment in, in shuttle. So they didn't have a long-term flight. They had short flights. Uh, so um, after they have adapt, they adapt to the zero G. When they re-enter the atmosphere, they may encounter difficulties in making decisions quickly, and they have problems with estimation of time period. Um, the figure seven shows uh, the grouped perception times of the four Austrian subjects. Uh, you can see the well the curves they present perception times on the day prior to launch, which is L minus one, the flight collection base, D2, D3, D4, and then the day of recovery. And you see the data above a jet interval, correct interval of one zero uh, one point zero indicates a late response. Uh so the perception is slowed down. And data below would just interval, interval, correct interval of one zero, uh, sorry, 1 1.0 indicates an early response. So the perception um, of time has accelerated. So the, the overestimation of the two second task interval values increased as the mission proceeded. So with a mission, they overestimated the, the time, um, time segments regularly. So, uh, but the thing is also interesting is that the, we have um, the uh, disturbances of time perceptions in microgravity as well. Microgravity, so the microgravity is when you're up there, yeah? And the macrogravity is when you're going down or going up, when you're re really feeling compressed. And so, the figure nine shows the microgravity uh, time perception performance. Uh, and you can see that it has a, this left to right slope downward, exactly. The, and um, the thing is that the finally, the disturbances are more or less the same in micro and microgravity. Uh, in Soviet space experiments, well, um, I'm, I cannot show you the pictures uh, with graphs because the book is in the office, but I still can uh, tell you what, what was that. So in Soviet um, practice, there were two main experiments that took place on the Salut orbital station. This was, I think, late 70s. It shows the same data, in fact, in micro and uh, macro gravity as well. Uh, but also there, is a, there was um, another result that seems uh, Interesting. An additional result is that um, there are personal differences in estimation. So people who are um, basically whose nervous system is excited faster, uh, they uh, overestimate really more than those whose nervous system is not reacting so far. So if you decide the subject into two groups, people who um, whose nervous system is more excitable than the others, then you will see two real. Uh, then you will see the real difference in um, the microgravity responses in these two um, groups of subjects. So these are the uh, more or less the objective uh, data that we have.
And what do we have with uh, with um, um, with anecdotal reports? This is also an interesting point um, because, well, all the astronauts and cosmonauts that I've been talking with in these twenty years, they are always expressing the same thought, the same idea that there is a huge lack of time and space, and that the flight was much too short and that, that they did not um, do everything that they wanted. And this is quite stressing for them, I may say. So, first of all, when we're talking about the macrogravity conditions, so when they're going up and they're going down, um, these are very specific situations that actually it is, a, it is an environment apart. Uh, because, um, first of all, the physical stress is enormous. Secondly, it is a subjective, uh, uh, there is a sensation of extreme um, risks for health and uh, life. And this affects a lot, all, everything that happens with them during the start and the landing, takeoff and landing. Um, so, also, when they um, land, well, when they dock to the station, um, they have um, a period of acute adaptation, as we call it. Uh, it is a very difficult period for all the subjects, for all the cosmonauts and astronauts, especially for those who are making their first flight. It is really hard. Um, about well, you have already already heard about fluid shifts. This is quite um, stressing, uh, and um, also uh, there is a secondary second effect that uh, they were preparing for the flight on Earth. They were using the ISS model that exists in um, the Star City. In the Star City, we have a um, complete copy. Of the of the modules of ISF, uh, the, this is this was made in order to learn everything on Earth. What's uh, found where? Um, how do you work with panels? How do you work with uh, uh, systems with computers that are on board? Uh, so the, the 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 complete copy uh, of all this uh, is found in the Star City. So. Astronauts, cosmonauts uh, that work there in order to prepare themselves for the flight, they all see it and they prepare it in the, in the Earth conditions. They prepare for their flight. But when they go up and they discover themselves in a real uh, ISS, uh, they always find out, all of them, that it was not exactly as they, as they thought it would be. And this creates Additional stress, so there are fluid shifts. There, are, there is stress of not finding the reality exactly as they wanted or as they dreamt about. And also, mm, so during this first week of acute adaptation, physiological adaptation, um, they have a, um, an awful lack of time, and uh, it is also aggravated by the fact that they are feeling well lots of stress from the physical point of view. Um, so, uh, what about the experiment? I will. I will. Um, I'll try to simplify what I'm doing. The whole concept, um, in order to fit in time. <laughs> so. Uh, the experiment that I'm making is, is on board experiment starting from 2015 is a content analysis method of crew communication with Earth. So this is a list of categories that I'm looking for in the um, audio communication of astronaut or Russian cosmonauts with Russian mission control. And um, uh, as you see, time is one of the categories that I use. Basically, me, I was interested in finding individual communication styles. 
this is my uh, this was my main thought. This is what my PC was devoted to. So um, after um, I think about three years of this experiment, we got um, 15 subjects. There's always a problem with quantity of subjects uh, when you're working with Cosmos because there are no crowds of people going up there. So basically, as you can see, in order to have 15 subjects, you have to work for three years. So um, what we did is we made uh, we clusterized the content analysis uh, categories used by 15 subjects. And we saw that we got three clusters. Um, that fit quite well um, into a classical approach of Virginia Satir. Um, I think that you, you, you've heard of her, I suggest. I don't know if I should, uh, should um, stop here for a precise talk about her. Anna, what do you think? No, you, you know that. You know the, the concept, right? Uh, I think we can also otherwise uh, leave a, a bit of time in in the questions if somebody doesn't know. But I mean, I think since there is uh, the reference, uh, that those who are interested, they can find more information uh, yeah. about her. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, for Cosmonauts, <laughs> we found, however, three clusters, not five. Why? We well, we suppose that Cosmonauts are all all of them are more or less congruent. Because, um, well, um, this is the result of the cosmos selection procedure. It is extremely difficult to get in the program when you're not communicating correctly. So you really have to communicate well in order to get there. So, and the structures, well, as this is, this is really, um, a special style that uh, all of the guys in the selection procedures, American, European, Russian, are really afraid of this, this distracting well, candidates. This is normally what's eliminated first. So, um, really, when we were looking at these three clusters, we found that uh, three clusters of type communication that resembles a lot of the, of the, uh, computer. Placator and blamer style. So, um, so we had three groups of customers. We got three groups of customers. And, um, where is the time category there? We see that the time mentions of lack of time more directly was, uh, more, um, was found more in Blamers and Blagatter's speech. Mm. So, um, uh, if we speak more exactly, we see that um, the average number of conversation around lack of time per week, more than seven Blagatter's groups, it means that they've been talking about the issue of time and lack of time. Uh, more or less every day. And um, the main type of complaint here is exactly is the improper plan uh, by made by terrestrial services. This is what they um, complain about the most. Uh, and um, the bravers are looking for the guilty <laughs> according exactly according to the to the to the name of the style. But implicators uh, claims, well, implicators um, time um, related uh, phrases, there is more about seek for help. So they are more seeking for earth help and um, um, maybe even support. So um, also, if time in space is filled by routine, Repair operations that happen quite um, well, quite normal. Unfortunately, uh, there is a feeling of lost time that appears, and um, the cosmos reported very intensively. 
for example, cosmonaut named Rizansky, um, while in flight, often, well, during his, his uh, I think he had like uh, two or three flights, and he was constantly uh, saying that he could do more for science, he could do more for cosmonautics and astronauts in general, and that he, um, as he was obliged to switch to routine like repair operation that did not have any real sense for him, he continued speaking about that, saying that it's really such a pity to waste time for that. And he continued to speak about it on Earth in the in the interviews as well. The other one, named Artemyev, he said just several days before the landing with he really was upset about that, but he said, you don't have any time to look back in flight, but you see that the flight is already coming to its end, and yet there's so much that I want to do, and I have never the time to do that. I never have the time to do that. So this is the lack of time creates real stress in, in cosmos and astronauts. Also, there is a, um, when you see the flight as a um, some kind of a line of uh, timeline, um, there is an interesting effect about um, two points. Well, we've already discussed the beginning of flight. That it's really a very special moment that they are experiencing. But there are two more interesting moments as well. It's the middle of the expedition, mid-expedition. It is perceived in a very special way. On the one hand, you have already adapted and uh, everything's clear and familiar, uh, but the feeling of monotony is growing. And this is, in fact, what we may have in the condition of um, home isolation as well. Because after you adapt uh, to the, to the, when well, after you begin the home isolation, it's a quite kind of a new situation for you. So uh, you you have some emotions about that. You have some feelings. You have lots of plans. Like I want to read this book, and I want to read this. I don't. I want to see this series, and I want to do this. And I have the I don't know um, the books unsorted. I want to sort the books. And um, after this first excitement, exactly as in space flight, uh, you arrive. The period when you see that it would last long, but from the subjective point of view, of course. And this is a kind of a plateau that creates a feeling of monotony. And uh, this is what cosmos experience in space flight as well. And um, mm, what what is the cosmos um, point on that? Is that um, they have a lot of energy. They're really motivated. And they want to do something big, something important, you know, during their flight. But they find out that there are repair work to do. And when they see the long time schedule, they see that repair work, for example, they were occupied in most of the time. And this is quite stressing. And uh, well, this is such a pity. Um, and um, this point of mid mid isolation maybe uh, maybe quite um, well I would not say stressful for the cosmos but this is the point where they when they start speaking about the loss of time more than before also um, there is a um, phenomenon from polar winterings that I wanted to talk about a bit it's called the third third quarter phenomenon. And uh, what is it? Uh, it is. It was uh, discovered in um, polar wintering. Um, um, this is psychologically the most difficult period of wintering when um, uh, there is a decline in performance and the mood and uh, drop of morale and bad, well, I know, bad mood, lack of sense and routine activity. Even though, uh, from objective point of view, uh, the conditions get better because uh, uh, there is an increase in daylight hours. But still, they have a real decline of performance in the third 
quarter of their polar isolation. The moon effect stabilized in the four, fourth quarter when the polar winters prepared to, um, to, to complete the expedition. They look forward to going home, to meeting their, I don't know, their friends, their family. And so these effects, effects of drop of mood and morality, they get better. After the two quite well known authors, Bechtel and Burning, um, who were working with polar wintering, I discovered this phenomenon in the um, beginning of 90. Uh, there was uh, several researchers trying to find the same effect in, on other isolated conditions, including space flight. It did not really work out. Um, Possibly because winters spend more time in isolation than the, the space flight. And, um, also because their structure of the, the, the structure of the, their schedules is different because polar winters do not have so much things to do in the, during the polar wintering. And as one of the customers mentioned in the first slide interview, when busy, there is no time to be distracted by your own thoughts. So, uh, but still we didn't, we, we, Fine. We did found the um, data about uh, third quarter phenomenon um, during one year flight. So there was a flight several years ago, and I said that lasted one year. It was, um, um, I would say, a um, one of a kind flight. I don't think that they were repeated. Uh, but in this one year flight, we discovered that the uh, quantity of coping strategies in speech, effective and both ineffective, uh, grew in the third quarter. Uh, also, this may be connected to the fact that the planning of one year flight was different compared to six month flight because, uh, when NASA was planning the, the one, the yearly flight, they were really afraid because we've never had this before. They've never done this before. Soviet Union and Russia have several flights that lasted more than a year. One person stayed on orbit more than a year. Americans have never done that. And so their point on schedule was that uh, they should, uh, the one year flight guys should have less work than in normal six, six mile flight. And so, um, we're not quite sure that it was the right thing to do because um, uh, in one year flight, uh, even though they had less work, they got really stressed, really um, um, for even from physiological point or from the psychological point of view after they landed, they felt far, well, they didn't feel so good. And the difference between Six month guys and one year guys, it was drastical. They were, uh, they felt boredom and monotony much more than the six month flight guys. So maybe it was not a good decision to give uh, less work in one year flight. Um, uh, also, I wanted to show you what happens with time. In the third quarter of space flight, when we take six month flight. Uh, even though the third quarter phenomenon, uh, in general is not very vivid in six months, well, we don't really, well, we, we see it in some, some subjects, but not in many. But the time category is really boosting in the third quarter. And this is a really interesting parallel with the polar wintering. Um, you can see that even the cosmonaut who was initially talking about time a lot, enormously, even in the first quarter, it was due to the fact that um, he was the cosmonaut who was sure that it is his last flight. And he was one of these extremely responsible guys who wanted to um, to solve a lot of real um, operational problems in the station. So. He, well, he had his own, of course, flight program, 
but he also said from the very beginning that he would try to solve a list of problems that exist in ISS for years. And he saw that um, during his life, he saw that they are not moving. So they wa he wanted to solve all these problems too. So this is why he he had lots of, well, more mentions of time in his speech than the others. But even him, even in, in this subject, we see that in the third quarter, the time category existing, they have no time in the third quarter. They have a sensation of time that passes through their fingers and that um, they are, they can, they cannot do and experience everything that they've wanted in this, in this, in this space. Right? So I am, um, Anya, um, uh, how, much, how many times do we have left? I would say uh, five to seven minutes maybe to finish up the, uh, the presentation and so that we can also open the floor for the questions. Okay, great. Then I will, I will try to be as short as possible. So um, in uh, polar winterings, there are periods of unstructured time because um, they, have, uh, they have no fixed schedules. For example, you know, there's winters who, who are focused on biological and uh, meteorological questions. They should make measurements from time to time, but all the rest of their day is unoccupied. And um, this creates problems. And um, um, maybe you've already heard that there's a rather revealing story that um, at one of the Antarctic stations one polar explorer stabbed another, so he hit him with a knife for the fact that the second one made spoilers about the book that the first one was reading. So it got so emotional. It got so, well, the level of stress uh, was so <laughs> enormous for this simple fact that there was a tragedy, real tragedy that occurred. They had to be taken away, both of them. Uh, from the polar station. Um, the third habitat that um, we're working with is the space chamber simulation. And um, what do we have in space chambers? Um, a second. Um, the confinement experiments are, well, basically one of the main things that we're doing in our institute because we have um, a copy of the living models of, of ISS that we adapt to the experiment needs. And um, for example, even now we are um, in the middle of a series we make with NASA, together with NASA. NASA it is an experiment named series named Sirius. Uh, it's written on their polyps for example now. And um, uh, for example, the, the guys that you are, uh, that you see now, they were confined for four months. And also we are preparing now the two next experiments that are eight months and one year confinement. Uh, what do, um, what are the, what, what sensation of time do they have? Well, First of all, the subjects, all subjects inform about an illusion of strong, uh, strong distancing from all the external events that occur during the first min minutes of isolation. So after the, the door is closed, uh, it's like the, you know, the, the timeline of their life was kind of cut in two. And, uh, the, um, sensation of all the events that happened before the door was closed is that is something that's very far, extremely far from the present moment. Um, so, and also this peculiarity of the time on type perception remain throughout all the experiments and uh, the events then that took place before the experiments seem very distant and the events that that took place in the experiment, for example, in the beginning of it, after several months, they seem very, um, very near. So, um, 
the the most important difference in cha between chamber um, studies and space flight is the same as in uh, polar winter. There are not much things to do. Their their schedule is not busy enough, and so we already seen in the previous chamber experiments that if you do not if you do not charge heavily the participants, they start to create the events themselves. So that means that they start to create conflicts and they get occupied with conflicts. Uh, and uh, this is why uh, when, well, when we're talking about our, our system, the um, isolation uh, uh, situation, this is also uh, a thing that you should uh, think about, that in order not to create conflicts um, in your crew, you should be fully occupied and you should occupy your crew as well with lots of things to do. But the most remarkable time perception to seven, that I, this is, this is the last one, I promise, um, happens in the bed rest, the anti-orthostatic hypotenusia. This is the situation when the imitation of space uh, Gravity, the zero gravity condition uh, is made with uh, the, the negative position of the body. So the head is um, lower than the feet. And so the subjects stay in this position for, well, depends. The really heavy adaptation period lasts for about uh, 14 days. And um, the, also the important point is that they uh, have no physical activity at all. So they're just laying down like that in the buff, as we call it. And um, mm, life in such conditions, uh, according to subject self-report, proceeds in, this, in, in the present tense. It is uh, only this moment that they are feeling. Uh, for, do you, uh, when about a week, they only, uh, they uh, have no more sensation of today, yesterday, and tomorrow. It's somewhere near. Uh, the, they have um, disturbances of sleep. Means that normally during the night they need about five, four or five hours. Um, that's all. And um, as sleep is no longer a day society because they sleep during the day as well, these four or five hours, they can, they can um, uh, sleep this norm throughout the day. Finally, um, uh, the whole experiment um, subjectively, be, to, well, upon the report, um, is felt like a, a one huge piece of time, one big day that has no beginning and no end. And this, I think, is the most horrible <laughs> time, time disturbance that we see in the uh, isolated and confined uh, research. And what, uh, for example, one of the subjects have made an interesting remark of, on that. Uh, I really like the, the phrase. He said, we live in the time Bullion is like, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, not very clear. The time bullion is a very interesting, um, well, I don't know, <laughs> definition of this state. So, and also the, I may say, I should say that the rehabilitation after, after all this, uh, after the hypokinesia experiment is really difficult and well, when this is a this is the uh, long term hypotenusia, it is as um, difficult as after a space flight. So let's sum it up. Um, you can see that um, in in uh, different situations there are well, different time time perception disturbances, but mostly um, the overall principle is that the more positive emotions you, you get and more the more charged is your schedule the more the faster time flows and um, the 
it really may help for for us all in the isolation that we're living in because we can um we should leave room for the physical activity of course because for example hyperkinesia when uh there is no physical activity it creates horrible uh harm for the human body uh in terms of rehabilitation is difficult so we need to have to get positive emotions uh we need to um uh plan the schedule you know to be quite busy throughout the day and also we need physical activity of course you know not to be absolutely um well in, in order to be able to walk when we're allowed to walk so i think that's all and um maybe we should leave this slide in order to uh, help for the question Yes, thank you very much, Anna. That was very interesting and inspiring. I, I learned really a lot of new things. And uh, I hope uh, also that our audience is curious uh, about uh, different uh, issues that were discussed. And I think we can uh, open up the floor uh, to, to different questions. I'm just also trying I'm very new to this uh, tool. But uh, we can also see uh i think we can also uh, uh if you have a question so you can unmute yourself and ask it and uh, while we are also uh, uh in this process that if you have more questions you can type it in the uh, in the chat and we can uh, take it from there and uh, how do we do this should can i ask a question sure I can yeah, hear hello. Mark. <laughs> I'm, I'm Mark from Freiburg. Um, so I, did you actually uh, any time ask uh, the cosmonauts when they came back from the six months, uh, how compared to normal life on Earth uh, time passed? Well, you would directly ask this question uh, about the comparison of the six months in space versus six months at home. Well, most of them, practically, practically all of them, uh, say the same thing. They say that the time passed extremely fast. Mm -hmm. And that, well, this lack of time, the feeling of lack of time remains uh, throughout all these lives. Mm -hmm. And um, also, the, um, mm, there is an, uh, also an aspect that um, I did not talk about. and. It's really important for them is that um, when they have free time, I mean they've done all their work for today, when they have the free time, uh, basically even even if they have books and they have I don't know series series or movies, uh, what they prefer to do is I think you know the answer to look on Earth, mm -hmm. to observe the Earth. In fact. I think that even if they're not talking about it, this is why they're going up there. You know, they want to look on Earth. Yeah. And so, uh, finally, uh, it founds out that, uh, they want their everything to be done in order to look, in order to be able to look the other uh, beauty on of Earth because this is what they value most. And so also this question of doing everything as fast as possible is also connected to this issue. Okay, thank you. Yes. Other other questions? I did have seen a couple of my students in the in the uh, in the webinar, so if you have any questions please come forward. Um, hello. Hi, Anna. Thank you very much. Hi. It's Zoe here. Hey. Um, hi. Um, I have a question um, uh, after the, the, the presentation. As you say, like time, perception, and emotions are definitely linked to each other. Uh, so are we uh, capable to say that it is only the subjective perception of the time that is linked to emotions? Or can we say with the precision that the objective 
time also passes differently. Uh, I know you talked about some measures, etc., but I'm not entirely sure of the kind of can we conclude that both subjective perception of time and objective time passage actually do extend or contract uh, mm -hmm. depending on um, various emotions that the human is going through. If you could clarify that, that'd be great. Mm. Well, it is quite difficult to make objective measurements, as I said in the beginning of the talk. But still, um, we can we can try to measure the time of reaction, and we we can measure the, the well the, the intervals of time. How do people um, perceive it? And um, also, these are these are the two objective um, things that we can we can um, use. But all, and also in the in the space flight in the big, well in the first period of space flight, as I said, there there are so much uh, there's so much evidence that they do not fit in the schedule because they need a more time for each operation that they know how to do. They done it on Earth, but they have um, lack of time for each uh, thing that they're doing. That um, this is possible. Mm, we, we can we can state that yes, there are there are links between objective and subjective uh, data. At least for those um, for those situations for microgravity, microgravity that we studied and uh, the Soviet uh, experiments and the US Air Force experiments studied. And also for the acute uh, adaptation period of space flight, about one week. This is, the, uh, I think, the only point where we can really um, bring together the objective and subjective um, data. Thank you very much. I think uh, Umbelina has a question. I see that Mark has um, wrote about um, the sun rises. This is a very, yes, this is, a, in fact, you know, that it's an issue of time in, in, in um, it has many aspects and I had to cut away some of them and uh, you get all the extre extremal environments that we're working with are connected with disturbances of um, of light um, rhythm circadian rhythms because on polar wintering stations uh, both polar night and polar day cause problems for people uh in space on the space station as as the ISS orbits the earth they have like 90 minutes of day 90 minutes of um of night and so they are not at all attached to the what they see on the window uh, they also always have the lamps uh and this are the this, these are the lamps normal uh, normally that uh they try to control their circadian rhythm. So they are, you know, they're dimmering at, uh, and all this stuff in order to make it like more natural. In uh, uh, chamber air isolation experiments, there's only under artificial light. And um, so what um, is done in space and in chamber experiments is that we create uh, forced um a light um well schedule in order for the subjects not to lose um the normal circadian rhythm because if you if you um leave it up uh to the subjects in the isolation experiment you will see that they will very fast switch to uh a absolutely different um, rhythm of life. They will sleep uh, for um, shorter periods 
and uh, they I, I do not remember exactly the all the all the data on that but as, as I remember uh, they switch after two or three months basically even even less they switch to like Two hours sleep, then they they execute some operations, then they make this well four I don't know four hours for example four and a half five hours, then they sleep this short time for about two three hours, and they recontinue. So um, the circadian rhythms in isolation is um, quite an interesting story indeed, and uh, the the sense of loss of time in these chamber studies are. Um, when we when we give um, the possibility to 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 switch on and off the light as the uh, the way they want, the the feeling of uh, complete loss loss of time comes quite fast, and they do not understand. They cannot estimate what day is it, what month is it, and even when he, what year is it yeah, after a certain time. But Mark, do you want to also comment? Because I know you were also doing some experiments with a similar chamber. Uh, so I would, maybe we would just, but I just, quick question and others can also answer a question, um, ask some questions. So it's just, so would you then even in space say that you would try to get a 24 hour cycle? Because what I thought was that because you're of course circling the earth, you have several mm -hmm. sunrises. Yeah? So there is no 24 maybe. hours. Uh, well, um, we have this a, internal rhythm, this circadian rhythm, which then gets disturbed with all the problems. Yes, uh, the question here with the cosmonauts is not really about the cosmonauts, about the terrestrial services, because there is a huge number of people working with the ISS mm -hmm. from Earth, and the question is that they, we should get the crew adapted to everybody else. Mm -hmm. I, no. uh, about about sleep on orbit, they all have sleep disturbances. Well, it's quite rare that the crew member reports that he had no problems with sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, they all start to sleep much less, about five, six hours. They feel okay. This is an interesting point as well because for example, the subjects that they were, they were worried about the fact that the, you know their norm for for sleep is like not more than eight hours. So they were worrying about oh, what should I do because I will not have enough time to get good good sleep. Um, after about I don't know ten days on orbit, they start to sleep less and less time. And finally, after the six months, we normally arrive to six hours or a bit less. Okay. And actually, nobody knows why. <laughs> Even for example, you know, at the main in the main conference, like International Astronautical Conference, the main why you now, uh, the guys that were they are talking about about sleep, they can show you tons of data and you know lots of graphs and finally in the conclusion they say well in fact we do not know why it happened but it's it's like that so and if as far as everybody is feeling okay with their five six hours sleep maybe it's not our problem okay thank you do we have more questions I'm, I would like to ask a question. Yes. I'm curious about um, the fact that when you go into space, you're in a zero gravity environment, and the fundamental expectation that things fall down is violated. And I assume there's an adjustment period for astronauts to get used to the fact that they can leave things like floating and then wrap them again. And I also uh, I was wondering how can also that affect your time perception while you're adjusting to that and making maybe mistakes because of that. Um, and also, um, and, and if it's known uh, what the adjustment period is, if there is one, and also the other way around, if when they come back to Earth and they have accustomed themselves to things floating around them, 
if they would make the mistake of just leaving something there, they'd fall off. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, oh. <laughs> Falling forks, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a normal thing. It's like even when, for example, I'm I'm making post-flight interviews about uh, one mm -hmm. week after the landing, yeah. and still, even after one week, after you know, me. they're constantly dropping everything because <laughs> just like, and every time it's like, oh my god, I have to think about that now because they, you know, right. it was like a question of adapting. They adapted to the situation number two. Mm -hmm. And to you know to readapt to situation number one, finally it's more difficult because it was easier to adapt to zero gravity. This is what mm -hmm. I report. It's oh, easier to adapt to zero gravity with these you know the the mm -hmm. things that will file over. The only thing is that uh, they should always think about is that they should um, put the all the objects have scratches, and so you have to when for example you you have a pen or a pencil. You, you write something and, uh, you know, if you, if you just, um, leave it, it would float somewhere and it may be dangerous because, because it would, if, if, if it would float some, to some place and that was, that would, for example, create a short circuit, this can be a real problem. And so this is why, um, the, the main thing that they should think about when adapting to zero G objects is that they should put everything in place. Everything should be placed in the in the correct, you know, because um the objects on ISS have their numbers and there are places for each object on the ISS. So the practice of being in a cosmonaut up there gives you a really hard training about keeping everything in order. Because well if you would not Place your pen uh, where it should be. Well, maybe you would never find it again. And after they come back, they still have this sensation. That everything you know should be put, should be really you know the storage system should be you know very very good. But uh, losing objects is a problem. And uh, if it's only a fork, it's okay. But if it's a bowl with food and you just drop it because you forgot, well, this causes more problems. This is what they all experienced after a fight. That's fascinating, thank you. Yes. I see Irene is coming forward. Do you want to ask a question? Wait, 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 we can't hear you. Yes, no? Sorry, then. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yes. Now we can hear you. Yes, Irene. Okay. Uh, I want to ask, um, uh, the work of the cosmonauts is dangerous. Do they think about the possibility of death? And are they religious? Or are they think about oh. transcendental future? Well, um, from, well, from one side, Cosmonauts experience, well, they have uh, risks for health and uh, life 24-7. Mm, uh, and they know it. And um, But the thing is that the, um, they have other attitudes to that. Because uh, prior to going to ISF, every cosmonaut, every astronaut uh, receives an enormous education. Uh, it is compared to, um, you know, bachelor and magistrate altogether. It's like about five or six years of education that they should get in order to be a candidate for a fight. So during these years, they study all the systems. They pass exam exams that are really difficult. And um, they learn a lot about the station, about the system, about all the objects that are on station. And they learn uh, for each uh, object, for each um, well, device, they learn the risks that it can uh, bring. And so finally, when you're talking with cosmonauts about, for example, um, feeling of death and uh, about the 
if they are scared. They are not scared at all. The thing is that uh, with all the education that they get, they have this very clear attitude that you should not be aware, you shouldn't be scared of the problem. You should know how to solve it. And so it is just the question of being informed. If you are, and this is what I propose um, basically to everybody, that if you are scared of something, of some potential situation that can appear, be prepared for it. If it is, even if it's a tragical possibility, have a plan. Uh, if, even if it's about your death, well, get prepared for your death. I mean, uh, prepare your, your family, uh, prepare them saying that, well, it's, well, it's natural. <laughs> we all die in the end. And, uh, well, if I die, you should do this, 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 and that. And so this planning is a uh, matter of coping with stress and anxiety for the in cosmos. And this is what they are, they are all doing. Also about being religious. It's really, well, it depends how uh, cosmos they are really religious, those who are not at all religious. I think that the percentage of the religious and the non-religious is more or less the same as in population. So, all the, also the thing is that, um, uh, as the cosmonauts and astronauts face the issue of working together with people that they normally do not choose to work with, because at least, well, American program, well, they really try to do something in order to put the, to get the people that are okay with each other. But Russian space program, even the, even though it was the Russians, uh, the Soviet scientists, who made up all the systems of um, correct crew collection. They don't use it. <laughs> so finally, you know, well, for example, when you assign customers that will go up, you don't look at the personal qualities and uh, the possible, you know, crew cohesion. You always look at the program that should be made on, on the station. So if, for example, it requires specialists of that kind, a specialist of this kind, you will choose these, these two cosmonauts that, that match the jobs. You will, well, the Russians do not think ab at all about uh, how they will feel together. So finally, the cosmonauts and the astronauts um, are very concerned about being very tolerant, accurate, to make no conflicts at all, because the conflict is something that really disturbs the flight. Uh, because they lose productivity, they this is stress, this question of health, finally. This is not they want to lose and do not want to even think about. So all the questions about religion normally are closed on station. They are not talking about this, this question. Everybody has his own business. Even if, for example, uh, there was a recent um, guy on station from United, United Arab Emirates, a Haza, uh, very nice guy, and he was doing his prayers five times per day. So everybody just adapted. And more, moreover, <laughs> you know, as his schedule was extremely intense because he had only two weeks on board. Uh, he, he was really overwhelmed, poor guy, because so the, the uh, first week is, is a really extreme, well, this acute adaptation is, is quite difficult for every person, and he had only two weeks on, or on, on the orbit. So, at a certain moment, the Russian guy that flew, with, what, that was with him and the team, he, he, told, he told me that at a certain moment, it was him, to go and say to Haza that it's time to make your prayers uh, because, well, do make them now because if you will not, if you will be out of time for the prayers, you will feel guilty and that's not what we want. So it's a you know, question of tolerance and health and really, I think that the ISF crews are, well, not 
Not always, of course, but in most of the time, it can serve as a model of human relationships. I mean, that the people who did not choose each other are well, finally they work in a very good um, cohesion, even even in this situation. So it was more or less the answer to your question, <laughs> with all the you know additional information. But very nice. Yes, thank you so much. I also have like one question in terms of like how we can also relate uh, this uh, experiments that uh, you have observed uh, also to our situation now. And of course, I mean, I think the uh, the biggest difference is that when the cosmonaut or the astronaut they go onto the mission, they know how much time is going to last. Yeah. And mm -hmm. for us, it's kind of like an open-ended uh, yeah. situation at the moment. <laughs> Uh, I think that this is the, the main problem in our situation. Uh, because even those cosmonauts who, who know that they will stay for six months, normally if they get prolong, if, if they get a prolongation, they're like, yes, this is what I wanted. But we normally, we do not want the prolongation. And, um, also there is a, um, this absence of, um of the of the finish you know of the of the final of the final point is i think the most stressing thing in the most stressing feature of our isolation so i think that well what we can do in this situation is take the worst plan possible and uh add a little more you know, just in case. And be prepared for this, you know, pessimistic scenario. And uh, try to feel it, all the pessimistic scenario, with things to do. I'm not, uh, well, you know, planning can be flexible or can be really rigid. It depends on what do you like personally. Because there are people who really like rigid planning. Uh, and for, or for example, you can do just a to-do list that would make like, you know, with huge things to do, like, I don't know, watch, I don't know, series of six seasons, something like that, really huge tasks, you know, and also, of course, education and of course, physical activity. If you have, uh, this is what guys from the chamber isolation experience, experiment say that they use uh the chamber is isolation to get fit because they have lots of um uh equipment for physical activity they have you know this um well they have everything that they can dream about and they have free time in chamber studies every day they have free time and so most of the guys well men and women uh that go to uh chamber isolation they go out in a better physical form, I mean about well, you know, fitness and getting fit, than they went or than they were then when they went in. So take the worst scenario, fill it up completely with things to do, and I think it will it will be quite all right. Yes. Thank you so much. I think we are uh, closing for now because the, the time has passed also quite quite fast. Yeah. Uh, I uh, I hope uh, that we answered all of the questions. However, if there were some questions that uh, maybe we missed in the chat, so uh, maybe we can also forward uh, to Anna with the uh, in the email. I don't know if that's uh, if yeah. That's... I see the chat there. I will uh, mark us for reference. I I, I will reread it all and um, write to Anna, uh, and she will pass it to you. Yes. And then, yeah, if the uh, Umbilina has also like a, a very, I think, as I understood, like a specific question regarding her uh, uh, study. So if she was wondering if it will be OK, if she writes you an email and you can also discuss. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, and, of course. Uh, and that's like yeah. Maybe more technical. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I want maybe, to maybe. thank you and congratulate you, Anna, for your work. It was wonderful to hear from you all things you're doing. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Thank you. If you want, I can um, write my email in the chat. 
you know, yes, you have uh, please let us know like yeah. which, which email address uh, we can uh, we can contact you so that yeah. can mm -hmm. uh, put it up on the on the group. So I know there was a, there was a comment regarding the uh, the quality of the audio sound. I don't know if there is if Anna if you were recording the audio separately if we can also somehow merge uh, or if that's the the quality that we have. I think that it's the quality that we have because I had um, uh, I I could not write it. I think I know I'm writing it. Um, I'll I'll check. Well. It didn't work well in the first place, so I will try to check what I get, and I will transfer the the file to you. Okay, perfect. And then I wrote an email in the chat, so if somebody wants to ask me something, feel free. Anyway, I will answer to all the questions that are in the chat directly to Anna. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, everybody, and it was really nice to see some of the familiar faces. Although we are not meeting uh, this July, but I mean we are keeping in touch. And before you all run away, so I have another uh, announcement. So we just uh, got confirmed the next uh, time and the day for our next conversation. It's going to happen quite fast. It's happening this uh, Friday at 10 o'clock uh, Copenhagen time. So we are talking with uh, our Italian colleague Massimo and our South Korean colleague. And so we will have this discussion in terms of the role of time perspective, the governmental policy, policies and the human behavior. So you're very much welcome to join us. I will post uh, also more information. So because it was just confirmed just like half an hour ago. <laughs> so I will, I will make a proper announcement. But uh, thank you so much for everyone for uh, joining us today. Thank you, Anna, once again, for beautiful uh, uh, conversation today. And we are looking forward to continue this series. Thank you, everyone. See thank you. you. Bye. Bye.